So the quiz that I handed back last time, some students' grades don't match what's on there. Is that what it is? Or like I, I was supposed to take off 20 points, which made it an 80. And instead, I gave you a 20. So just double check. If you're one of those students, I need you to like leave me your quiz after class or something, and that way I can adjust the grade. So just check what you have. The number of points taken off should have been out of 100. So go look at it. Um, quiz, let's do this. Okay, last time I handed out a uh, summary sheet. Anybody not get this? Last class? So everyone has that? All right, so look. The homework assignment was to finish the limit problems and to also do what? Watch the 1.6 video. In the 1.6 video, I state here, where is it? An important property that the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over x to the n equals 0 for all positive integers. Right? And in the notes, remember I gave you a test, a quiz over. Uh, Another set of notes, and it said, know these limits, and I gave you those limits on the quiz. So anytime I say, you know, look at a video or something like that, and in there it says this is important, like, I expect for you to be able to regurgitate that for me the next class, if you're kind of caught on to that, all right? But the bigger thing on this is, look, x is getting bigger, right? x is getting turning into a large number. If you take a large number and you raise it to a power, and that power is positive, it gets even bigger, right? You take one and you divide it by a huge number, that gets really small. So this limit approaches zero. On your sheet, that's put the fourth one down, fixed number over infinity is zero. That's what, the, that's what this one is, all right? Fixed number on top, the bottom's going to infinity. Why can I, why does this not work if it's a negative integer? What if it's x to the negative 2? What does x to the negative 2 really mean? On, if x to the negative 2 is on the bottom, that really means x squared on top, right? Which means you have a number on top that's getting big. That doesn't go to 0. That just gets big. So that's why we have to say positive integer here. The next problem had directly to do with the video. So in the video, I go through and I show, you know, approaching left and right and what these things mean. So in the hopes that when you came here, when I get to talking about this, you've got some sort of idea of what I'm saying. The limit as x approaches negative 2 from which side? Left. Means I, here's negative 2, right? I'm going to get onto the function here. I'm going to move towards negative 2 from the left. So here I go. I'm going to start moving towards negative 2. My function is headed where? up to positive infinity, okay? And that's it, positive infinity. What's the limit as x approaches negative 2? And I do not specify the side. That means you have to check both left and right. And for the limit to exist, it has to be going to the same place from the left and right. So as I came in from the left, it went to positive infinity. When I come in from the right, where is it headed? Well, not positive infinity, right? And since they're not going to the same place, the limit does not exist. Now, what's the limit as x approaches 3? So 3 is over here. If I move in to 3 from the left, it's headed where? Negative infinity. From the right, negative infinity. And so they both go to negative infinity. So the answer is negative infinity. And then the final one, what's the limit as x goes to negative infinity? So this time, your x value is going to get really big but negative. What's the function doing? So big negative means move this way, right? If I move this way, where's my function headed? Towards the horizontal asymptote of y equals 0, right? To the x-axis, that's y equals 0. So the function is headed towards 0. Right? Getting smaller and smaller. All right, let's do a poll. 
How many of you did okay on that? I don't know. I have to look at it. What you're asking? How much is off? If yeah. Well, I I'll just see how people did on it. I mean, how do you, how many of you just feel okay with it? That's what I'm. I know you don't know how I'm gonna grade it, but okay. All right. Um, questions over homework. No issues? Yes? Number 50. Let me see. I need to see it first. 50. I did one at the end of I did that one at the end of class or something very close to it, right? Same exact one, yeah. 53. So we have number 53, limit, x approach is 0, sine 3x over 5x cubed minus 4x. So let's just try real quick plugging zero in, right, using a direct substitution. We plug in a, a direct substitution. Three times zero there gives you zero. Sine of zero is zero. And then on the bottom, you know, zero goes in and you get zero. So we have zero over zero, which according to our, our little cheat sheet says that when the form of the limit is 0 over 0, we want to do some algebra, some sort of trick, something, right? So the fact that I see the sine 3x there immediately makes me think about sine junk over junk. That's my first thought. So I'm going to see if there's any way I can get a what to appear down here, a 3x. But notice that both of these um, terms have a common factor in them. What do they have? An x. So how about I, how about I rewrite this a little bit? Limit x approaches 0, sine 3x over x times 5x squared minus 4. And then just to really try to illustrate what's going on, I'm going to peel this apart. Which was kind of what I had tried to influence you to do last class, start just peeling things apart so you can see where the problem's occurring. Um, peeling that 1x and putting it underneath the sine 3x here, the other thing over here. And uh, does this cause a problem for us? If I plug in 0 for x, no. Right? That's, that's just going to turn out to be 1 over negative 4, and that's, that's negative 1 fourth. Who cares? This over here is not quite what I need, right? I need that to be... 3x on the bottom. So how do I make it 3x? Just multiply 3 down here, but I have to do a 3 up here also. So I'm, I'm doing a 3 over 3 there. If you like, instead, just make it like 3 over 3. That's a 1. I haven't changed the problem. But that 3 down here can just slide next to the x. Yes? Well, this is... This is not multiplication. This is not this times 3 times x. Sine is a function. The 3x is the argument of the function, the thing being plugged in. You cannot peel something out of a trig function like that. It would be nice if that's the way it worked, but that's not the way it works. The best we can ever do with something like this... Shh, shut up, kid. Kid already doesn't like math. No, I'm just kidding. I like kids. Just just not that kid. <laughs> That's the best you could ever do. Okay, look. I did not peel a 2 out. What did I do? I used a trig identity. So constants inside trig functions are stuck. 
That's why I have to force this on the bottom to be a 3x, because I can't control the 3x in the, in the sign. Okay, so at this point, oh, you know, I'll move this down. Um, I'll rewrite it all. Limit x goes to 0. I had that 3 that was still there. I'm going to put it like this. There you go. So I'm just, again, everything's all out there in front of us so we can see what happens to each piece. What happens to that when x goes to 0? Nothing. It's just 3. What about this? That's going to turn into 1 because we have matching junk, and that's not the only thing we needed. We needed the junk to also what? Approach 0. And when you plug in 0, you get 0. So it's got everything I need. And then over here, this goes to what? Negative 1 fourth. So this is turning into 3 times 1 times negative 1. Ooh, negative 1 fourth which is negative 3 fourths. Does that address the question? Yes? Out here? Oh, yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah, that 3, you're free to move it around. You just can't put it in here and make that like a 9x or something like that. You can't do that. OK. All right, let's get into today's material. Um, we are going to be talking about two different types of limits today. We have limits where, let me see, the first type of limit is limits where when we plug something in, our answer is infinite. So like 1 over x squared was an example that I showed in my video where when you try and plug 0 in, 1 divided by 0 is what? Undefined, right? So what happens, according to this sheet, when you get a fixed number like 1 over something going to 0? What happens? It says here you're either going to get infinity as your answer, negative infinity as your answer, or the limit will not exist. And we will have to investigate that behavior to figure out what's happening. All right, so that's what our first focus is on, is when we plug things in and our answer is infinite. The second thing we're going to look at is instead of letting x go to 0, we're going to let x go to infinity. So these are two distinct types of limits. Understand? Okay, so let me start with the first one. These are called infinite limits. I'm going to do a couple of examples. Tell me what's happening here when, when I try and evaluate this limit. I get what on the top? 5. On the bottom, I get 2 minus 2, which is 0. And automatically, as soon as I see that, I realize I have a fixed number over 0. And that tells me that I'm going to get what? Either positive infinity negative infinity or does not exist. So a positive and negative infinity or does not exist. Do you all follow that? That's going to be the standard from here on out. Anytime that happens, fixed number over zero, it's going to be one of those three things. Y'all with me? Okay. The question is, how do we determine that? Which of those it is? So there's different approaches. Different instructors use different sort of styles. I use more of a traditional style which is to really just get into the actual limit, into what's in here, and just algebraically try and figure out what's happening. All right, that's my approach. Some other people do it graphically. Let's see how this goes. And we'll, we'll be taking votes and seeing how people feel about it. All right, so the numerator here, 5. That's not a problem, right? 
Five is a positive number. No, no issues with that. The denominator, however, is getting really small. Yes? So what happens to a fraction if your numerator stays the same and the denominator gets big? What does that then go to? Fractions on, I mean, sorry, numerator stays the same, bottom gets big, the thing goes to zero, right? This is kind of like the opposite of that. The numerator is staying the same, the bottom's getting smaller, so your fraction gets what? Bigger, right? Should get bigger? Do you all understand that or not? I can, I can show you an example. Look, what's 5 divided by 1? 5. What's 5 divided by 0.1? So which is bigger here, this one or this one? Well, you could do it on a calculator. Hopefully you can do it in your head. It's 50. And then what's 5 divided by 0 0.01? 500. What's 5 divided by 0 0.000? Sorry, 0, 0, 001, 5,000, right? So you could verify these on your calculator. Look what's happening. Each of these denominators is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, isn't it? But what's happening to the result, the result of the fraction? They keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So what I'd like to know, I mean, I know it's going to be infinite, possibly negative infinity, but possibly does not exist. Where do you think the does not exist comes in from? Remember we said approaching from both sides has to be the same. It could be possible that from one side it's going to positive infinity, the other side negative. So that's why that third option could happen. You all okay with that? All right, so let's, let's now try and do this. Um, I'm going to kind of split this down here. Okay, so here's my approach. I already know it's one of these three, right? I know it's one of these three. So I like to, I like to start with the number line. I like to put where I'm headed. Where am I headed? To 2. From which side of 2 am I headed? Left side. You mean I'm coming in like this, right? All right. So I'm going to do this kind of like a trial and error type thing or like a, a guesstimation. Pick a number somewhere really close, and here we get into that close thing, really close to 2 but on the left side of 2. 1.9, you could go 1.99, you go 1.999, right? We could keep going all day. But, so we all have to kind of agree that maybe 1.9 is close enough. For, for this class, we'll say it's close enough. 1.9. And keep in mind that what I'm trying to figure out here is not whether or not it's positive, not, not that it's infinity, because I know it's infinity, right? It's whether or not it's positive or negative. I'll show you a does not exist problem in a second. You'll see the difference. So let's just try plugging this in. Let's take 1.9 and let's plug it into this thing and see what we get. So what would, what would 1.9 plus 3 be? 4.9 over, now what's 1.9 minus 2? Negative 0.1. Do we agree? Let's vote, since you all are just kind of looking at me. Are we okay with this? Now, I am not concerned at all right now about what the answer is. Like, I don't care what this number is. What's concerning for me is, is it positive or negative? What is it? It's negative, right? Because you have a positive number divided by a negative number? So you're going to get a negative number. So all I care about with this is that this is going to be a negative. I like to do a negative and circle it. That's a negative number, yes? And if I try anything closer to 2, this is going to continue to happen. Why? If I take any number right here, 1.9999, doesn't matter how many they are, and I subtract 2 from it, 2 is bigger than 1.999, isn't it? So that number, that, that little subtraction is always going to produce a negative number, isn't it? As long as I'm coming in from which side? The left, right? Which is where I'm looking at here. Now, if I were coming in from the right, would this be the same? It would be positive. So that would be different, but that's not what we're asking. We're saying from the left, right? So in summary here, I'm going to kind of move this down. Here's what I have happening. I have a fixed number, right, on top that is always positive over a number 
that's going towards zero, right? But that number is always what? In this particular problem, this number here is not really zero. It's getting closer, but it's always what? Negative. So I'm going to put like negative next. Oh, that's not negative. Negative next to it. So I have fixed over zero, which I know gave us three possibilities, but I can guarantee you the top's always positive, the bottom's always negative, which the result is that this should be negative infinity. Do you see that there's no like work in this is in terms of like, okay, you factor it, you cancel. I mean, there's not algebra involved here. It's thinking through, right? It's producing enough, convincing yourself that it's, this. It's not like, okay, here's the test. I know it's infinity, negative infinity, flip a coin, go with infinity. You know, that's, you have to think through this. All right, so let's try the same sort of issue, same problem. If I come in from the other side, or you know what, let me do this. I'm going to change the problem a little bit. Negative two um, from the left of x squared plus four over x plus 2. So tell me what's happening here. The numerator, or is it headed? Eight. How about the denominator? Zero. So right away I'm thinking fixed over zero, one of three possibilities, right? In fact, would you agree that this is going to be fixed positive number over something that's going to zero? But right now I don't know if it's positive or negative. Do you see that? I don't know this thing going to zero if it's going to be positive or negative until I investigate this number line a little bit better. So let's draw a number line. And let's put what on this number line? Negative 2. And let's approach it from which side? Left side. Someone give me a number. Negative 2.1. What's the most common mistake I see there? Negative 1.9. Wrong side, right? Zero's over here. Negative one's over here. So negative 1.9 is on this side, not on this side. So be careful with that negative sign because you can get caught with that during a test. If it helps you, yeah, I mean, definitely if that helps you you know, recognize what's going to be on each side, then, then draw it, you yeah. know. All right, so now what would happen if I plug this in? On the top, can we all agree that the top is going to get close to 8? I mean, there's no, that's not where the issue is, right? The top is going to be close to 8. The issue is the bottom. So the top, I'm just going to put um, the top is fixed. I know it's headed towards 8. It's a positive number. I'm not worried about that. All over. Now, what is what is negative 2.1 plus 2? Negative 0.1. This right here, turn that just the bottom becomes negative 0.1. So what are we getting there? Negative number. And that should always be the case, right? Even if I get closer and closer, this should keep happening. So my overall determination of this is that the top is fixed, the bottom's headed towards zero, but again, just like the previous problem, it's headed towards zero through negative values. So I have a positive over a negative, which again results in negative infinity. No, not every answer is going to be negative infinity. It's just that's that's what I've shown you so far. Okay, let's go ahead and take a poll of whether or not this is okay. All right.
That's good. Let's try something else. Limit. X approaches pi from the right of x plus pi over pi minus x squared. And you know what? Let's not, on the limit here where I said approach x from the right, take that out of there. I don't want you to approach it from the right. I want you to approach it from what? If I don't put anything there? Both sides. Both sides. All right, so first thing, just plug pi in for x. Tell me what you get. On top, pi plus pi, 2 pi, divided by 0. So I have a fixed number. What can you tell me about the top? It's always positive over something that's going to zero, yes? The question is, is it going to zero positive or negative, right? Positive or negative. So what, what I, if you're following what I've been doing, the next thing you think I'm going to do is what? Draw a number line, but I'm not. Why? Now pi is a number. That's right, good. Because whether or not I come in from the left or the right, when I plug in a number right here and figure out what that is, I know it's going to be really close to zero, yes? And we've been looking at, is it positive or negative? It doesn't matter because what's the next operation that's going to occur? Squared. So it's going to turn it positive anyway, isn't it? And so there's nothing to investigate here. The bottom is always going to be positive. Very close to zero, but positive. So because of this squaring, I can determine that this is going to be positive. And so what's the answer? Positive infinity. So this limit is positive infinity. These problems are weird because there's not like a whole lot of work. It's just like you don't you write enough down so you're convinced. And then hopefully when I grade it, I'm convinced you know what you're doing. Are you good on that or not? On that one. Okay, next one. Limit x approaches negative three. of x minus 3 over 3 minus x, or make it plus x on the bottom. So your first step is what we've been doing since the beginning of limits, and that's just plug in, see what happens. What do you get up top? Negative 6, right? Not 0 over zero. What can you tell me about that numerator? It's fixed, it's negative, right? And what can you tell me about the denominator? Well, it's headed to zero, and I don't really know what it is yet, right? This three plus x, or three, yeah, three plus x was not being squared or anything, so I can't guarantee it's gonna be positive. So now I need a number line. On that number line, I put what? Negative 3. And then which side am I approaching from? Both sides, which means I need to look at each, each case individually. So let's first come in from the left side. Someone give me a number to the left of negative 3. Negative 3.1. Let's go ahead and plug that in and, and look at what's going to happen to this ratio. We know the top is, is headed towards a fixed number. We know that it's headed towards negative 6, so we know that that was negative. The bottom is headed towards what? 
What's 3 plus negative 3.1? Negative number, right? Negative. So it's headed towards zero, but it's negative. So what can you conclude from this? It's positive infinity. From, from that side, right? Try the other side now. Right? Since the limit did not specify which side, I need to check the other side. Give me a number coming in from the right, negative 2.9. Again, when we look at the ratio, we have a fixed negative number over something headed towards zero. But this time, what's happening? 3 plus negative 2.9 would give you a positive number. Right, 3 plus negative 0.29 is the same as 3 minus 2.9. That's 0.1. That's a positive number. So you're going to get a ratio of a negative number over a positive number, which in this case right, would be negative infinity. And so what are we going to determine for this limit? Does not exist. Because the left and right have to be the same. They both have to be going to positive infinity or both going to negative. So it does not exist does not exist. All right, this was just work in here, right? This is my final result. So I've given you an example where I didn't tell you which side, right? And you got an answer of does not exist. In the previous one, I didn't tell you what side and you got an answer. So just because I tell you I don't tell you which side, that doesn't automatically mean it doesn't exist. It all depends on, on looking in here and kind of working through it and convincing yourself what's happening. All right, how many of you feel pretty good at this point? Good. Now, I'd like to do this problem without referring to a graph. Just what we know, I should say, without referring to the graph of cotangent, right? Just going off of what we know about basic pre-cal trig stuff. So the first thing you're supposed to do is plug in negative pi, right? Maybe you don't remember what cotangent of negative pi is, and that's fine. But you do need to remember that cotangent is defined by two more basic functions that we all should know, and that's sine and cosine. How is it? What's cotangent is which one over which one? Cosine over sine? So this is cosine theta over sine theta. All right, so now you need to plug in negative pi. What is cosine of negative pi? Close. Negative 1. Negative 1. Because remember, on the unit circle, I, I always go off the unit circle, right? That's 0 degrees, straight out to the right. Pi is halfway, right? Negative pi is just the other direction, right? So you're still over there at what point? What is that ordered pair? Negative 1, 0, right? And then cosine is always the x-coordinate, which in this case would be negative 1. And sine is always the y-coordinate, which would be 0. So this is negative 1 over 0, isn't it? So we have a fixed negative number divided by something headed towards 0 of which I do not know what is happening there. Now, 
Now here's, I'm giving you this problem because this, is, this problem differs from what we did before in, in this sense. Watch, watch what I'm going to do. I need to put the, the um, number on the number line, which here is what? Negative pi, right? So here's negative pi. I'm supposed to be approaching negative pi from which side? The right side, so that's over here. And then I'm supposed to be trying to figure out a number that's, that's to the right side of negative pi, but close. So, you know, you might start actually trying to figure out what that is, and maybe you want to break out your calculator, but I, my challenge for you in this problem is to do it all without a calculator. It's what you know about trig stuff, pre-cal stuff. So do you see how it's not as easy to just pick something and plug it in and know what's happening as it was in the previous problems? Do you all see the difference? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to superimpose on top of this number line what it is that I'm looking at. What, what am I interested in here? The sine function, right? I want to know what, how it's behaving around negative pi. So what if I draw on top of this? Here's zero. What if I draw on top of this a sine curve? We all know what sine looks like, right? I hope so. We're all here because we got through pre-cal. Sine starts out at the origin, right? And then it goes up, comes back down, goes over, right? So sine looks like this. Goes up, comes back down, goes back over like that. And where does it hit? at pi and 2 pi. But the sine function is periodic, which means it repeats itself, right, every 2 pi. So I can keep drawing it to the left, or I could draw it back to the right, couldn't I? And that's, notice how I've lined things up here. I mean, I put 0 here because 0 is here. Pi, I didn't quite do a good job of making those equal distant. But if I go backwards and put, like, negative 2 pi here, I should be able to draw a reproduction of this sine curve backwards, right? And so it'll look like this. Okay, let's vote if you're okay with what I'm doing up here or not. All right. So now look at what I've done. We are approaching negative pi, right? We're approaching it from the right, but we are on the sine curve. So let's get on the sine curve and start approaching pi from the right, negative pi from the right. Aren't we down here? And we're headed towards where? Zero. Well, we knew that though, right? The question was, was I positive or negative? What am I? Negative, because I'm below the x-axis. You see that? So I can now conclude that this piece up here in the top right Right, that that's going to be positive. I mean, sorry, negative because we're coming in from the bottom of of the sine curve. So my conclusion here is I have a fixed negative on top over something headed towards zero, which was also negative. So my conclusion is positive infinity. That's the answer. Now, from your little voting, I feel like you all followed me, so I have a different question for you. How many of you feel like, just sitting there right now and after watching me, that you, you have enough of this in, in your background? Like, you feel com comfortable enough with sine and cosine and pre-cal to go from cotangent to this and to draw a sine or a cosine curve if needed? How many of you feel like you could do okay with that? All right. As long as it's sine and cosine, you should be all right. All right. So if if you're oh, okay, what happened? <laughs> all right. So we're we're kind of close over here. I guess the the reason I'm asking this is because you need to make sure that you you know precal is not like a prereq and you box it up and put it away and put it up in the attic. I'm mean, like we need to pull things out of there every once in a while. This is just an example of one thing here. Um, a lot of you like the unit circle, right? As opposed to the graphs. Could you have done this using the unit circle instead? The answer is yes. Let me show you real quick how you could have done it. 
what you're doing here is we all know that negative pi is over here. And we are looking, again, for the sine part of it is the one we're concerned about. We're looking at the y coordinate, which is 0, yes? And we're approaching negative pi from which side? From the right, which are things that are bigger than negative pi. So how, what is that? Bigger than negative pi, closer to 0. Where is that? Give me an example of an angle that's between 0 and negative pi. Negative pi over 6. So you're, you're saying something like this over here? 0 would be straight out the right side, yes? This would be negative pi over 6. And then what about straight down? What would that be? Negative pi over 2. And then something like over here, what would this one be if that's the diagonal? Negative 3 pi over 4. And so what I'm trying to get you to see is that you're, you're moving from 0 over to negative pi, but you're doing it on the unit circle. So you're rotating clockwise until you're getting closer and closer to what? Negative pi. Tell me what's happening to your y coordinates as you start getting closer and closer there. They're all what? to zero, but they're all what? Negative, because you're in the third quadrant. So you can do the same exact analysis without, the rely, without having to rely on the curve. So it's up to you which, which of those made more sense, all right? Either way, you need to figure it out, yes? Hmm? On the denominators, on the radians, I'm not sure I understand. I'm looking for the y values of these. The y coordinates are how how far they about how far away they are from the x-axis. So each of these y values is a certain distance from here, right? Those distances are negative values because I'm down below the x-axis. As I come around and swing closer and closer to that point, those y values are getting smaller, but they're getting but they're negative the whole time. Okay. Let's see. I think that's probably okay. I don't think there's anything else out of those. Let me just make sure. I'll give you one more. Limit, x approaches 5 from the right of 2x plus 10 over x squared minus 25. Ah, uh, 2x, hold on a second, I want this to work, hold on. Yeah, plus 10, that's fine. So where's it headed? What's the top headed towards? 20? Over? Zero. I have fixed. I can even tell you a little more about that. It's positive. Over? zero and I need to figure out what's happening here, right? Do you want to do a number line now? No? No? Yes? Okay, what about the squared? Does that guarantee me positive here? No, because I'm subtracting 25. It's not the whole thing squared. That's different. All right, I'll try the number line now. I, I saw a shaking of the head no. What, you seen something else? Okay. Like you, you're just saying you didn't want to do it. It's, okay, approaching 5 from the right, coming in from this side. An example of a number here. Here. 
So you don't want that to be your mistake, right? You understand everything, but you're picking the wrong number, right? Always orient yourself if you have to. Zero's right here, right? Five's here. To the right of five is 5.1. So tell me what will happen. We know we're going to get a fixed positive number on top. Fixed. And in the denominator, what do you have? <clears throat> What's 5.1 squared? Is it bigger than 5 squared or smaller than 5 squared? It's bigger. It's bigger than 5 squared. And you could check it if you needed to on your calculator if you weren't convinced. So this number is going to be bigger than 25, so you subtract 25, this is going to always be a positive number. So you're going to get 0 on the bottom, but it's going to be approaching through positive numbers. So the result of this is what? Infinity. All right, I'm happy. Are you okay? Yes? Uh, <clears throat> All right, let's switch over to the other types of, of limits. So those were called infinite limits. Now we're going to do limits at infinity. So we have this concept that from now on, we're going to talk about x going to infinity or x going to negative infinity within the limit. And, and let's briefly discuss what this means, just to make sure we're all on the same page. x going to infinity means we're just letting x get ar like just arbitrarily large, right? It's going to grow without bound. As that happens, what happens to the function? So what we're doing is when x goes to infinity, we're imagining ourselves looking out the right side of the function forever and seeing if the function's actually going to a specific place or not. And then x going to negative infinity is the opposite. We're going out the left side on the x-axis forever and seeing if it does anything. So let's start with an example that always confuses students. The limit as x goes to infinity of sine x. Okay, so think of this, let's try and think of this visually. What does the sine function look like? Right? That's, that's, a ba that's your basic sine function. That's this sine in here, right? And we're saying what happens to that sine function as you go out to infinity? Is it headed towards one thing, a specific number? No, right? It keeps oscillating back and forth. You can't say it's headed towards one because it goes, yes, it does hit one, but then it goes back down. Can't say it's negative one because it comes back up. Can't say it's zero because it's going on both sides. It is not headed towards anything, right? Therefore, the limit does not exist. It has to head to something for you to say the limit exists. And in if it goes up to infinity forever, like if it keeps going up, that's fine. Infinity would be an answer. But in this case, it's not headed towards anything. So it does not exist. Done. And there's no work that needs to be done there. All right? Nothing. How about something like this? Limit. X goes to infinity of X to the X. So what's happening here? This x here wants to get real big. And I'm just, I'm mentally thinking of a big number. That's not very big, right? A hundred. And I'm doing that and I'm raising it to what? The hundredth power. And then I keep going out a thousand to the thousand. This is just becoming infinite, isn't it? It's just getting larger and larger. So what's, what is our answer then? Infinity. See, we don't say does not exist here because it is heading somewhere. It's headed towards infinity, if, if that makes any sense. But it's not oscillating. So this answer would be infinity. Um, how about the limit as x goes to infinity of 
10x. Eh? What's that doing? What does tangent look like? It's got these asymptotes, right? Remember this thing? Those asymptotes were at pi over 2 and negative pi over 2. But then didn't it keep repeating itself? So you'd have another one of these, then another one of these. And we're saying as you go out to infinity, is it headed anywhere? No, it just keeps repeating this weird thing, right? It's not headed to one place. It's, you can't say it's headed to infinity, right? Because once you get past a certain number, it starts off again down here at negative and comes up. So what do you think? It does not exist. So all these limits I've given you so far, there's really like no work to be done on these. And these aren't really the ones that interest us, but we should be comfortable with these. The things that are more interesting for us are things like this. Limit x goes to infinity, x squared plus x over 4x squared Mm, minus 3. Now that's something that we like to investigate. Because there's something interesting happening. Where does this go as x gets bigger? So let's think about it. x squared, so you got this huge number, you square it, you add a huge number to it. That whole thing is getting really big, right? Infinite over, now the bottom, x squared, that's a huge number squared, times four, huge number, take away three. Three is like insignificant, isn't it? Compared to this huge number. So what should it be? Infinity. And so for the first time, we're getting this form of infinity over infinity. And on your techniques, top left corner, when you have infinity over infinity, what are you supposed to do? Some algebra or some trick. Unfortunately for us, there is not any factoring that you're going to be able to do here to try and get things to cancel. Right? It's not going to happen. There's no conjugate. There's no get common denominators. Remember when you were doing all that on the homework for the limits? There, none of that's here. So we're going to have to attack this with something else. And what, what I'm going to rely on is what was on the quiz, on the very front first problem of, of the quiz, which was that we all have to agree that the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over x to any positive power is 0. Are we okay with the idea of this? You give me a big number, raise it to a big a positive power, that's going to become a small ratio, right? One divided by a huge number is small. So if we can live with that and we all agree with that, then we can proceed. So let's take a vote. Are you happy with that? Are you, are you willing to live with that limit? Okay. Is this limit the same? Limit x goes to 0 of 1 over x to the n? Is that also 0? No, because you have, what, fixed over 0. Fixed over 0 is infinity, negative infinity, or does not exist. Right? Totally different limits. So please do not confuse the two. It's only when x goes to infinity does this work. So how in the world do we intact this? Here is the standard technique. All right? This is the standard technique for attacking a limit like this. What we do is we identify the highest power of x in the denominator, which in this case is x squared. And what we're going to do is we're going to try and make this x squared go away. So the only way to make x squared go away is to divide by x squared, and then it'll turn into a 1, right? You'll see after I do it, hopefully, why this is going to work. 
But I can't just sit here and divide by x squared, right? I mean, that would change the problem. So instead what we do is we multiply the top and bottom by, what is that? 1 over x squared over 1 over x squared. It's really a 1, right? So I'm, I'm technically not changing the problem, am I? This blue is, is the number 1. So I, I'm not altering it. Just going to make it look different, but it's the same exact expression. The only, con only thing you'd have to really concern yourself here with is that what if x was 0? Could you do this? No, but where's x going? That's far away from 0, right? So you don't have to worry about that. As we go to infinity, this is, this is well-defined. And so now just pass the 1 over x squared through both the numerator and denominator, and let's see what we get. Limit x approaches infinity. So multiplying here through, what do you get? What's well, 1 over x squared times x squared? 1. All right, next one through, plus what's x times 1 over x squared? 1 over x. So one of those x's cancels. And then on the bottom, what's 1 over x squared times 4x squared? Just 4. And then minus what's 3 times 1 over x squared? 3 over x squared. Okay, yes or no on that? All right, good. So, yeah, go ahead, what? That's exactly why we're doing it, yes, ma'am. I mean, that is the point. So let me try and kind of reiterate why we're doing this. If this is the highest power of x, x squared, right? and I'm gonna kind of come through with an x squared and divide it, wouldn't you say that I'm guaranteed that whatever's here is gonna turn into like just a number? Yes? So there's my number, it's gonna be a four. Since this next term definitely was a lower power of x, whatever's down here that remains is still gonna have an x in the denominator. Yes? Which is this. And then up, upstairs, I could, I could really care less what's happening upstairs. I, I don't care. Because what I can promise you now is that this bottom part is not going to go to zero, right? It's going to be nice. In fact, I know that this part's going to go away. Because I, I divided through by a highest power of x. This one right here should have an x in the bottom. That's going to squash down to nothing when I take the limit. And this won't, so I'll still have a number down there. No division by zero, I should be good. I hope that kind of makes sense. All right, so let's now apply the limit. Take the limit, these two pieces, 1 over x and the 3 over x squared, both fall into this category of being a fixed number divided by x to a positive power, right? 1 divided by a huge number goes to 0. 3 divided by a huge, huge number, right, huge squared, is going to be going to zero also. So these essentially vanish from the problem after you take the limit, and all that's left is what? One fourth. So what we're saying is that as x gets really big, as you go out to the right, this function is headed towards one fourth. That might remind you of something from college algebra. We have a function. Here's one-fourth. We have this dotted line out here. And what we're saying is our function is getting closer to that as we go out to infinity, right? What did we call that in college algebra? Horizontal asymptote. Remember that? So how many of you remember back in college algebra that one way you could figure out the... Um, horizontal asymptotes of a rational function was to identify if, if the powers were the same, which they are here, that you just took the numbers in front. How many of you learned the, that or remember that? Yeah? Okay, that's the way you do it when you're in college algebra. When you're in calculus, you don't do it that way. You do it this way. In fact, in our notes, it says 
in the video that I asked you to watch, it says that the way to find a horizontal asymptote of a function is to actually take this limit of the function. That's how we define horizontal asymptotes now, is by doing that limit. So you may be like, well, I really liked this in college algebra. So let me give you an example of something that wouldn't work, that you have to use this, that college algebra, you don't have a way of doing it, all right? So maybe I'll sell you on the idea that it's, it's worth it to us. How about this? Limit x goes to infinity. Well, before I sell you, let me just cover a couple of, of other bases here. Um, how about x plus 1 over x squared minus x? I'll make it a plus x. I'm not ready to address x squared minus x yet. Where's this headed? Infinity on top, infinity on the bottom, right? Can y'all change this 1 right here to a 4? Just so no one tries to factor an x out of the bottom and cancel. Just make it, make it x plus 4 over x squared plus x. So the top set it to infinity, the bottom set it to infinity. I break out my algebra. Nope, the algebra is not going to work. No factoring or anything like that. Can't do it. So what's the standard technique that we use when we have infinity over infinity? Find the highest power of the denominator. Come through and multiply top and bottom by 1 over that power of x. And then what do we have here? x plus 4 on top, x squared minus, or plus x. Let's multiply that through. Tell me what I get on top. What's 1 over x squared times x? 1 over x. What's 1 over x squared times positive 4? 4 over x squared over 1 over x squared times x squared would be 1, and then plus, last one there, 1 over x. Now, let's take the limit, right? Let's take our limit here. How many of these things vanish? All three of these vanish. Is that going to be a problem? Well, they all head to 0, right? So I get what on top? On the bottom? See, the ones there, see, that avoids a problem, doesn't it? That's why we come in with that highest power on the bottom, because that guarantees us that we're going to still have a number down there. What's 0 divided by 1? 0. See, 0 divided by a fixed number is OK. That's just 0. If it were flipped over, that would be a problem. Questions? I'm sorry that we don't have more time for like, let's do some group activities. And there's just so much in this class that I have to kind of grind through. It's more of like me showing you stuff. So. Okay, I'm going to quickly come through with what on top and bottom? 1 over x squared, top and bottom. I'm not going to show the step. I'm just going to write it out. So just remember, what I came in here with was a 1 over x squared 1 over x squared. All right, that's what I brought into this. 1 over x squared, 1 over x squared. That was all based off of the x squared on the bottom. 
Which of these vanished to zero? 2 over x does, 1 over x squared, 1 over x squared, those all go to zero, don't they? What about what's left, though? What does x go to? Infinity, right? Infinity over what? 1. What's infinity over 1? Infinity. In other words, this becomes infinite. This function, as you go out to the right, takes off to infinity. You could say this, that after these vanish to nothing, you're really left with the x over 1, and that's just going to become infinity. All right, now let's try something a little bit more, a little bit more challenging. Limit, x goes to infinity of uh, 3x squared plus the square root of x over the square root of 5x to the fourth plus 1. So here's the deal with something like this. This is not a rational function from college algebra. Rational function was a polynomial divided by a polynomial. This is not that, because you've got a root in here, and then this is a square root function, and what's under it is a fourth degree polynomial. This is just nothing you looked at in, co in college algebra as far as graphing. So you never looked at horizontal asymptotes of something like this. But if we were trying to find the horizontal asymptotes, we would need to let x go to infinity. So what's our standard approach? OK, so we look at the highest power of x that we see here, right? And the standard approach has been to come in and multiply by 1 over that, 1 over that power, yes? But there's a problem here. You could. You could, but it's still a square root, right? I mean, that doesn't change. Like, even if you rewrite it this way, the bottom, right? Then if you come in, is that what you're suggesting? Yeah. Yes? I'm not quite sure. I mean, I know what you mean by breaking part. I think you mean, like, Square root of each. Well, we can't break this into two roots, right? We we have properties of roots says that if you have this, you cannot just do this, right? You cannot just split a root into two if it's plus or minus in the middle. If it's, if it's multiplication, we can. Um, it's okay to rewrite this this way. That's fine. But I'm not sure we gain anything by that. Let me, let me take you through this, since this is the first time, all right? Let me take you through this. Here's the thing. Whatever I come up with, right, whatever I come in here with needs to kill off x to the fourth, yes? But it has to be on the top and bottom, so it has to start out outside the root, and then it needs to be forced inside the root, yes? So you have to think about the way roots behave before you can really proceed with this. If I say, what's the square root of x cubed, are we all comfortable with rewriting this this way? As x squared times x? And we always like that because if we have x squared and this is a square root, then really this just becomes what? x on the outside, square root of x. How many of y'all are, are okay with that? Just let me know real quick if, if y'all are all okay with that. Okay, so this right here, this turns into this, into this. And most people, well, 100% according to the vote, understand that. That's not the direction we want to go. See, we're going to start with something on the outside, right? And we're going to have to force that thing into the root. So I want you to look at this backwards. Okay, go the opposite direction. If I have an x sitting outside the root and I force it back in, it's really equivalent to doing what? 
on its way in, what happens to it? It gets squared, doesn't it? That's the, that's the idea. So what I need is I need to pick something out here, 1 over something, x to a power, so that when I square it, I get x to the fourth. So what should I pick? x squared. I should pick 1 over x squared. And that way, when I pass it into the root, it's going to become 1 over x squared squared, which is 1 over x to the fourth. And then the same thing up here. And then you multiply this through. So let's try this. What happens when I distribute 1 over x squared through the top? I think I heard three. Is it, yes, three? The first one? And then what about this next one? Is it all right if I just write root x over x squared? Is that okay with everyone? Now on the bottom, let's take our time through this. When I force that inside, I said it gets squared, yes? And that means it turns into 1 over x to the fourth. And that's going to multiply times everything that was under that root. So there's the 1 over x squared. goes in the root, gets squared, comes your 1 over x to the fourth, and now that 5x to the fourth plus 1 is sitting there waiting for it to distribute through. What if I had put 1 over x to the fourth out here? It would have been 1 over x to the eighth, and then that would have not done what I want it to do. I want it to leave a number when, I'm, when I pass that through. I want a number to still be there. All right. Are you okay simplifying this? Whoa, what happened? Whoa. Hey. There. Are you okay simplifying this? That's really 1 over x to the what power? Uh-oh. I'm not doing a limit. I'm just trying algebra here. That's x to the 1 half over x squared, right? To do this, you do 1 half, take away 2. 1 half minus 2 is negative 3 halves. Well, I feel like the wheels just came off. x to the negative 3 halves but we don't like to write it that way. We'll write it 1 over x to the 3 halves. Ooh. Is that all right? <laughs> this is this is this. All I'm trying to do is rewrite this so that it looks like what? 1 over x to the n, where that's a positive number. Because I know this is going to go to what as I let x go to infinity? It's going to vanish away to zero, right? All right, let me, let me multiply this all through and see where you are. Okay, I have three top, top left corner is three. Top right corner is one over x to the three halves. The bottom is square root. Don't forget that's still there. And what was there? When you multiply this through? 5 plus 1 over x to the fourth. Circling the things that are going to vanish. Right? As I take the limit, those are going to go to zero. And so, my answer is what? 3 over root 5 which is also, if you rationalize it, 3 root 5 over 5. I'll accept both answers. Those of you who've had me before know that I have a big problem with rationalizing things, so I'm not going to give a big story lecture behind it, but this answer is equivalent to this answer, and I accept both. All right? I'm not going to take off if you don't turn it into this. All right. 
Can we go a little more? We're almost there. 15 minutes. I've got a few more things to show you. Ready? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I won't go through a whole problem, but let me show you. All right, so you know what to come through with. X goes to infinity. You want me to use a square root still? Okay. Because if I use a cube root, then what happens when you push things in a cube root? What happens when you push something into a square root? It squares. So if you push something in a cube root, it cubes. But I'll, I'll stick with the square root to keep it within the scope of the book, all right, which is they don't, they don't mess with anything more than square roots. Um, what now? Oh, you want something odd? Uh, 4x cubed plus 1. So if I'm going to try and kill off x cubed, right, I need, I need that when it goes in and gets squared, it becomes a, a 3. So in other words, um, what would be the best way to explain this? I need something x to a power, right, so that when I square that, I'm getting what? 1 over x cubed. That's what I'd like. So properties of exponents say that I could go 1 squared is going to give me the 1, right? And then this right here, let me, let me call that question mark like m, okay? m is what we want, isn't it? This statement right here is the same as 1 squared over x to the what? 2m, right? Because what we're doing is we're taking x to the m, and we're squaring it, which means you multiply the exponents, the m times the 2. So I need this 2m to turn into what? A 3? Wait a minute, hold on. What did you say? I need the 2m to what? Turn into 3, right? So I need m to be 3 halves. That's the way it would work. So I come in here with 1 over x to the 3 halves. 1 over x to the 3 halves. Change this to a 5. It would work the same way. It would be 5 halves. Change that to a 6 and change this into a cube root. I mean, you could do any variation now. Good question. Limit. X goes to infinity. X squared minus 1,000X. Now, before, before I do this, don't change this on your paper, but let's talk about this real quick. What if that was a plus? What's infinity squared? Big infinity, right? And then you add to it 1,000 times infinity. Gets even bigger, doesn't it? So that should just be infinity, shouldn't it? When you add two infinities together, you get infinity. But with the minus sign, it doesn't work. It's not something you can just spit out the answer. Now, on your sheet, this is one of your forms, infinity minus infinity. Right. So I'm going to write down over here that this is the form infinity minus infinity. And that's a bad situation. Who on the test is going to volunteer to put zero as the answer here? Any volunteers to put zero? No? Good. Because that would be very wrong. Infinity minus infinity is not zero, because infinity is not a number. It's not like 4 minus 4. When we say infinity, what we're saying is we're, we have a number. It's getting big, 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 minus a number that's also getting big, but the rate at which they're getting big may not be the same. So we have to resolve which one wins. Sometimes one beats the other. Sometimes they tie. Sometimes they compromise. And they say, well, let's just meet in the middle. It, it just depends. Every problem is unique. So, 
the key to this, when you have subtraction of infinities, is to try and convert subtraction to multiplication. And the standard technique for, for converting subtraction to multiplication is factoring, something you've done a lot of. So every, this is a simple factoring problem. Does everyone see we can factor this? Greatest common factor is what? X. Factor out next, you get X minus what? 1,000, right? Now, you no longer have infinity minus infinity. You have what? You have an infinity out front. This time times this whole thing in here is infinity take away 1,000 is still infinite, isn't it? What's infinity times infinity? It's not on your sheet. Do you all see that? It's not on your sheet because it's not something that requires work. It's something that you should just, oh, infinity times infinity should be infinity. Two huge numbers multiplied together should be big. So this is going to become infinite. That doesn't make sense that it would be positive infinity. X squared is a big number, right? You take away 1,000 times X, even though 1,000 times X is big, it's not as big as X squared is if X gets big enough. So eventually what happens is this term overpowers this one. And it just becomes, the whole thing together becomes a big positive number. Right? So you all see what I'm saying? Like if I plug in 1, what do I get? 1 minus 1,000, that's a negative number, right? So that doesn't look like positive infinity. But if you let x get big enough, keep getting bigger, this one's going to just make this one look insignificant. Right? Okay. Something else along that line? X to the two-thirds minus X to the five-sevenths. What do you think infinity to the two-thirds power is? Two-thirds means you take the cube root, right? What's the cube root of infinity? What do you think? Big number, take the cube root of it. Still big number. And then square it. So now it gets bigger, right? Then you take a big number. You take the seventh root of it. That makes it smaller, but then you take fifth power, so that makes it bigger. And as x gets bigger, these just get bigger and bigger. Do I follow this or not? So what kind of form do you have here? Infinity minus infinity, which is zero? No, it's not zero. Please don't be that person, okay, that gives me zero. That's the same person that's going to give me zero divided by zero is one, right, when they do a limit, zero over zero is one. No, it's not. I, you know what I'm saying? On the limit, when we first started doing limits, we did zero over zero, and we said that's a bad thing. I said, but someone's just going to put zero over zero and then put answers one, and that's it. Don't be that person, please. All right, so when we see infinity minus infinity, we're thinking factoring possibly. How can you factor that? Wait a minute, it's not as easy as this one, right? But can you factor it? Well, maybe with a nudge, if I nudge you in the right direction. I'm going to do something, and you tell me what I've done, all right? Oh. What have I done? I, got, I found the least common denominator between the two fractions. So I found a number that's about the multiple of 3 and 7, which is 21. I rewrote both these fractions in terms of, of, of that denominator. And by doing that, what I can recognize from this, hopefully you recognize it too, is that I could factor out... Anybody see it?
again, maybe I'll, I'll nudge you this first time. 14 over 21, x to the 14 over 21. Let me see what would happen here. How do I turn in x to the 14 over 21 into x to the 14 over 21? I have to multiply it by 1, don't I? Minus, now how do I turn x to the 14 over 21 into x to the 15 over 21? Multiply it by x to the, I heard it, 1 over 21. Why? Because when you multiply two things that have the same base, you do what to the exponents? You add them. So I needed to turn 14 over 21 into 15 over 21, so I added just 1 over 21. Let's take a quick poll, whether or not you got that or not. The question is not, would you have done that on your own? The question is, do you understand what I did? And now maybe you could pull that out on your own. All right. What does this give you? As x goes to infinity, where is this one headed? It's going to become infinite, right? It's x to a positive power. That's going to get huge. Eventually, it's going to get huge. Times, now, 1 minus, what, x to the 1 over 21, that's going to, again, it's the 21st root of x. But if I give you a huge x, that's still going to be a huge number. So that's becoming infinite. What's 1 take away infinity? Negative infinity. So you have infinity times negative infinity, which is negative infinity. A positive times a negative gives you a negative. So it's infinite, but it's negative. Yes or no on that? How did I recognize which part? Oh. From here to here? Uh, I, that would all be dependent on how comfortable you are with, with algebra and just understanding numbers. I always like to see the, this part because this, we won't, we're trying to reduce it to something where people won't, you know, be able to argue with us about it. Like, if you agree this becomes this, then it's hard to argue with me that that's not going to become huge and that that's not going to be huge and that when I subtract this, it's going to be a big negative number. It's hard to argue with that. Where here it's like, well, convince me, you know. I mean, I, I'm not sure I believe that this number is going to be smaller than this number necessarily. I mean, I think maybe because this is 14, that's 15. Yeah, but here maybe not so much. I, it, again, it's 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 a little bit of a danger zone though there that I would be concerned about. And, and we did do this one right. We talked about this last class. Limit x goes to infinity sine x squared over x squared, just something like that. No? So where is this headed? Zero, because the top is what? Up. Oh, careful. Well, junk. We have junk over junk, but we can't use that because they're not both going to zero, right? But the top, the bottom is headed, okay, let's start with the bottom. The bottom's headed where? Okay, where's the top headed? It's bounded. It's bounded, right? Look, it, this is a sine function. As I plug in infinity, sine of infinity, what did we say about sine of infinity? It keeps oscillating. So we said that limit didn't exist, right? By itself, it doesn't. But if you divide it by x squared, that's going to become infinite. It's going to start squashing that oscillating thing down. I showed it to you last class. And it, like, funnels the, the curve. So this thing is like a bounded thing, bounded over infinity, and that goes to zero always. That's on our thing, fixed 
over infinity is zero. And on the bottom, I say fixed means non-zero number. Oh, I should have put bounded. Oh, no, last one, sorry. Last one says bounded over infinity is zero. No work needs to be done. Homework. One point six. One, two, oh, page sixty seven. One, two, then three through seven odds. I broke those up because those are different ideas, okay? Um, like two is different than three as far as concept-wise. And then there's going to be a bunch of limits now. Uh, 13 through 33 odd. Let me make sure there's not a problem in here. Let me want to avoid a certain thing here. Uh, you know, scratch 33. Just make it 31. All right, that should get you going. Let me warn you about numbers 1, 2, 3, and 3 through 7. Those problems, I didn't do anything like that in class. So what they are is they give you a graph and they try and have you find limits, kind of like what your quiz was. Yes? Numbers three, three, five, and 7, what they do is they give you some conditions. Like they tell you, draw a function that has these conditions. And what I want to do is see if you can come up with something there. All right? It's homework practice. If you, if you have questions on it, I'll, ask, I'll answer questions next class. I will not quiz you on anything from 3 through 7. All right? On Thursday, pardon? Videos. Uh, videos one five. Probably just watch that. One five is not going to take us long. Our test is what a week from today, next Tuesday. So we need to try and like crank out any issues next class. And I would watch one five. Just that'll make life easier for us. It'll give us more time to review if we all just kind of get through that. Yeah.